All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, is this loud enough, or should I get a microphone for the people in the back? I'm assuming that means yes. <laughs> I'm Benjamin. I know most of you guys because I'm from Cincinnati. Uh, for those who don't know, hello. Uh, I work at Google as a developer advocate for Android TV. Uh, it's been uh, my jam for the past year and a half. Uh, I think TV is actually pretty fascinating, and uh, what we're doing and the things we're looking at and, and trying to grow and the space is very different. Like mobile, I'm assuming most of you are mobile developers. Um, it, it has its own issues, but then when you get to TV, like it's, it's like a completely different landscape. So it's kind of a cool area to look at. Um, and then this talk is going to be about bridging those gaps a little bit. You know, making magical multi-screen moments. If you want to reverse the words and making multi-screen magical moments, you know, make, whatever you want to do, like just make moments that are magical for your users. So this isn't my living room but that'd be friggin' sweet. Uh, but you know, you can kind of see there's tons of technology at your fingertips while you're watching TV. We have microphones, we have cameras, we have tablets, phones. If you're able to put an app in a book somehow, you know, kudos to you. But there's tons of different surfaces right in front of you in TV, or in front of you while you watch TV. Um, we haven't even touched on what you do like Nest and Ring with the doorbells and stuff and other things inside your home, you know, security systems. But while you're watching TV, what can you do to build those extra magical moments? So TV users. There's kind of a spectrum, if you want to think about it, for TV users. You know, it ranges all the way from the lean back user to the lean in user. Lean back, you know, it ranges as well from I bought a TV because everyone was doing it. I wanted to be cool. But it kind of sits in the closet and never uses it. You know, the next on the spectrum is more like I watch every week I watch uh, How to Get Away with Murder. I love the show. It's great. I'm going to watch it. Whatever. Go a bit further and it's going to be like, oh, I want to discover more. You know, what else is on that network? What other channels and shows are of interest to me? Then there's the other user that goes even further. You know, oh, Annalise Keating, what a cool character. Who plays that? Oh, that's also the same person that was Amanda Waller in Suicide Squad. What else is she in? And it keeps going. And this goes not just for TV, but like sports. You know, how many of you have a fantasy team for fantasy football? Wow, okay. I'm not going to talk about sports. The rest is talk. I need to make new slides. But this lean in concept, we're going we're to really go towards this second half of the spectrum. Uh, assuming you already have a TV app, you've already covered the, the left side of the slide. You know, you already have your content, it's on TV, you're showing it to your users, they're happy. But how can you bridge that and make it further? You know, so if you have a TV app, you already know your users are happy. You know, they're just passionate about your content. Um, I love th these pictures because it ranges from like the sports fanatic all the way to like the toy geek and nerd and there's content for everyone out there. Uh, and, and the passion is real. Like those that have fantasy teams, you're passionate about football, or at least as players. But you watch it every week, probably. So, like every good concept, we're going to build it on three pillars. So the three pillars we have are media control, content immersion, and frictionless interaction. Uh, I'm going to use the term second surface. I don't want you to think about this is just for phones. Maybe it's for like the, the Echo Show or the new smart displays from Google. Uh, maybe it's for uh, the, the doorbell or some other surface. It, it doesn't have to be just for phones. Uh, any, any concept or anything in the living room could count as a surface. One day we have the smart refrigerators. Those could be a surface. So media control, what type of things fall under that? You know, maybe notifications for when new shows are available. Maybe it's playback control. You know, we, in the past, we've talked about the assistant on Android TV and how to control playback. Comes to content immersion. What does that mean? You know, going deeper and digging further. I'm watching uh, on a, a Fire Stick. They do a really good job with uh, X-Ray. Uh, you, you're watching a movie, and you tap a button, and all of a sudden, you see all the cast of characters. Uh, it's taking that even further. Um, I'm going to lean into the sports analogy again because I tailor this whole talk for three people. Um, <laughs> so if you watch football, you're probably constantly on your phone checking your fantasy team. In a sense, that is already a second surface application. Uh, while you're watching TV, you're engaged on a second surface, seeing how your team's doing. You know, are you winning? Are you losing this week? 
Last one is more like frictionless interaction. Um, you know, I just got a new TV, I have to set it up, I have to log into my account. How can I make that easier? You know, there's a, a show or I want to rent a movie. You know, how can I make payments even simpler? You know, what's that frictionless interaction? How can you reduce that barrier? The point though is you want to take what you currently have and just build on to it, layer in more. You know, enable those passionate users to go even further with your content. So I wasn't kidding about sports. <laughs> um, so sports, the three pillars. Let's use them as an example. Let's start with the basketball game. Basketball game, game is going to start tonight. I'm really excited for the UC Bearcats. I get a notification on my phone. Oh, man, I was way, way over in this other land, completely forgot about the basketball game. And now, hey, I have a notification. It reminds me I can switch over to my TV and watch the game. Just one, one way of just approaching media control. You know, going back to football, the fantasy example. You know, I have fantasy football up during the game, and I can see how, how my team's doing. You know, hopefully A.J. Green beats the Pittsburgh uh, Steelers tomorrow. I'm a Cincinnati fan, so for Pittsburgh fans, tough luck, we're going to win. <laughs> um, but yeah, the fantasy football team, I think, makes a really good second screen experience. Imagine if ESPN has ESPN on the TV, and then they have this fantasy tie-in right there. It really, really lends itself to a good example. Um, and then the last example, you know, like UFC fights are coming up, and you want to have a good party for Friday night. You know, you can easily initiate that purchase from a TV. And you know, you might not use Google Sign In or Google Pay. Google, ugh. you might not use Google Play billing. You know, you might be on some other TV service. You know, maybe it's a, a Tizen or a PlayStation 4. This concept still applies no matter which TV platform you're on. So, how can you do it? You are all developers here. You probably want to know, like, the code. Show me the guts. Well, for the, the media control, you know, you can just use push notifications. If you want to get more advanced with, like, proximity, use nearby. For that content immersion, you know, that, that's in your control. You can build out the app to do whatever you want. Uh, ESPN already has a fantasy app. They don't have to do anything more. They just have to know when to show it. That frictionless interaction, again, you can do all this with push notifications. You could use nearby to initiate proximity. Um, the best part is these are already established technologies. You don't have to wait for the next OS or anything. You can do this all today. So I'm going to start with an example for login. Um, you always think login's a simple example. Uh, it helps cut down scope. You don't have to worry about uh, who the user is and sending push notifications or pulling any of this other information out. You just want to focus on understanding who the user is. Um, but best part about logging in with TV is this wonderful on-screen keyboard. <laughs> How many of you have used this type of keyboard on your TV? All right, keep your hands up. How many of you have used this sucker and enjoyed it? OK, we have a liar in the back. This is not blurry. Your eyes just cannot process all this that's happening. But input to a TV has been kind of interesting. And if we look at input for, to a TV over time, it's a, it's, it's a funny story. You know, originally, we had the touchscreen TV. You know, that's what my grandparents always had. But you know, as we evolve, they get a little bit more advanced. You don't want to have that go for just to change the channel. And we evolved into a, a better remote model. You know, like what does a user need? They have a guide. They have a go back button, D-pad, numbers, channel up, channel down. And you're like, OK, this is kind of cool. But you know, as an industry, like, let's make this better. And we got to this thing. You know, let's have one remote, remote to rule them all. You know, if, uh, if you have a stereo system, and you have a sound bar, and you have a TV, and a microwave, and a fridge, and you want to control them all from a remote, you know, we have that ability somehow uh, with, with these universal remotes. But we learned our lesson, right? They're not the best remotes. Uh, this is what uh, people coin as, you know, like the grandma epidemic. You know, like, hey, we only need just a couple buttons. Channel up, channel down, volume up, volume down. But that's almost too simple. You know, eventually you're going to need a few more things. You know, you want to change channel to 42, whatever. You can't really do that easily. 
unless you want to hit channel up 42 times. Um, but if we look at OTT devices, over the top, you know, Shields, Fire TV, Roku, they all have a simplified model as well. The Shield remote is, uh, is that easy to see? It's like black on black on black. <laughs> okay, but uh, the Shield remote has uh, three buttons and a D-pad. Pretty simple remote. The Fire Stick, they have three buttons plus three more buttons for play, pause, and seeking, and a D-pad. And Roku takes what Fire did and adds four more buttons for apps. So it's a pretty simplistic model. These, these well, Roku in particular, they don't care about channels. They care about apps. And so having apps instead of channel up, channel down is, is more beneficial to their model. Still doesn't make typing your, your password on a, on a TV easy. So, but looking at these remotes and looking at their user manual, way simpler than that universal remote. But TV remote isn't the only way to control your TV. You, know, you can have gamepad controllers. The Shield has, uh, has a gamepad controller. They're more geared towards gaming, but it's actually a really nice device just for controlling your TV. But gamepad controllers also have their issues. You know, so like Nintendo, every time they release a new console, is iterating, changing, and, and making their gamepad controller hopefully better. Uh, but then other times, it's been kind of set in stone. Since like the PlayStation 1, Sony's had the same pattern and the same gamepad. So well, even with gamepads as an input device, though, typing in your password is not easy. So we have another input device. You know, I'm just going to go through all the options, and then I'll talk about sports. So phones, how many of you remember this phone? Yeah, it was like your trusty phone, T9, you know, it had a small learning curve. Oh, I hit two, three times and I get a C, you know, and, and we, we learned, we adapted with the T9 keyboard. We then said, wait, we could put the full keyboard on here. This is great, we'll add a trackball, we'll have all this advanced stuff on a phone, it'll be amazing. And it was for a time, like even Android, like the original, Droid. It, uh, it had a full keyboard, but this has its own limitations. It's a QWERTY keyboard. Not everyone wants to use a QWERTY keyboard. Typing in different languages is very difficult. This is gonna focus mainly on English language. And we got another iteration. We said, well, what about a digital on-screen keyboard? You know, you can change the language. You can change the locale. You can change the customization. So as a user, you have a very customized experience for typing. This, this is much better for typing passwords, right? Okay. So then we iterate again, and we get the voice. Voice is great. You know, asking an assistant to set a timer, you know, where's, where's the closest uh, gas station, you know, adding a reminder for something, tons of commands you can do on the assistant, and, and it's wonderful. Typing a password through the assistant, you know, what's, what's your password? Capital P, lowercase a, dollar sign, S, W, zero. No, wait, it's O. No, it's zero. Oh, man. Reset. <laughs> you know, like, it's not easy to type a password over voice. So knowing what your use case is and the best way to accomplish that through which remote or, or whatever means is something to consider. So we have all these different things, yet we still ask our users to use this universal remote. This button heavy, yeah, you're flinching back there. I don't blame you. It's either cold or you're flinching at this remote. I flinch at the remote. Um, but it's, it's a heavier user. And then sometimes it just doesn't work. And it's like, hey, pull out a second remote. And, and you get down that problem, uh, which isn't a good problem either, either. So how do you build an experience that doesn't make it feel like a remote's required? Um, that's kind of the, the tough question. If we look at Android TV setup, if you, if you try to set up, you probably don't even realize that you use a second screen and it's already working. So you get prompted with a question, do you want to continue on your phone or not? And most users, they don't, they don't even realize. They just pull out their phone like, yeah, sure. And it's a really simple flow. You get directed from the TV to your phone. On your phone, you're going to get a notification. You're going to select that notification, choose your account, log in seamlessly and it's going to be great. Uh, so Android TV's setup already does a second surface integration. Uh, but how? How do you do that? 
again, you are all developers, so you probably want to see more code. I promise we're getting there. Uh, nearby. Nearby is a great way. It's very, very much um, a great tool for these second surfaces. You want to do things that are close in proximity. Are you in five feet away from your TV? You, know, you could use nearby as a great way to do proximity detection and set up a, a tunnel connection. The way it works is you're going to have an advertiser and a discoverer. This discoverer. There's a lot of ERs in Discover. Um, but you can have more than one advertiser. Uh, I showed you like that futuristic living room that I want to have one day. Uh, but imagine like you have a TV in your bedroom, your living room, if you're lucky, even your bathroom. So now you have multiple advertisers, right? Um, and, we can, and we can handle that with nearby. Uh, just know that like it's best to have the TV be the advertiser and push the model of discovery to the phone. Um, how does this work? You know, there's a lot of things in flight to make this work with nearby. Imagine your TV is on the left and your phone's on the right. Um, what are the order of events? So first, the TV is going to send a notification like we saw with the setup flow for Android TV. And it's going to start advertising. Hey, I'm a TV. Let's do something. The phone's going to start discovering. And the phone's going to hopefully find your TV. They'll establish a connection. And then they should stop discovering and advertising. Uh, discovery is a, a fairly expensive operation. Uh, it's doing a lot of Bluetooth LE scanning, but if your Bluetooth's off, it's going to do Wi-Fi stuff. And if that's off, it's going to fall back to location. And the nearby team has a bunch of robust solutions for fallback plans. Uh, eventually, they should find each other using nearby, assuming like they're within nearby. Um, but uh, you want to make sure as soon as possible you stop discovery just to help out your phone's battery. Um, once you have a, a secure connection, um, it is an offline peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encrypted connection. And uh, once you have a connection, you can do whatever you want to do on the phone. Collect their username, password, collect their payment information, whatever you need to do. You know, package that up, send it back to the TV. Hey, we did this work. Maybe send a token to the TV. The TV should reply back, acknowledge. Hey, thanks, phone. I'm glad we have this information now. And then the phone can close the connection once it receives that ACK. So uh, once the whole conversation's done, just close up the connection and let the user continue on their way. So to recap, user opens up a TV, opens up your app on the TV, sees they need to log in, direct them to their phone, get their information from the phone. The phone's going to uh, send that back to the TV. The TV acknowledges, and the phone closes the connection. So I know there's other talks about security later today, but I do want to touch a small bit on it. Um, with Nearby, you want to authenticate the connection. It's strongly recommended. And it's as easy as just showing some code. Um, the Nearby API actually supplies an auth code that you can just slap onto a dialog or on a screen and just say, hey, is this the code you see on this other device? Uh, this is great because like, if some guy's walking down the street, walking their dog, and they get a notification, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to set up this TV. I'm going to be the man in the middle. Um, this is a way to like help prevent that. Not that that's a common use case, but just a way to like help secure and confirm with the user that trust that these two devices are acting together. All right. All the engineers in here should jump for joy. There's a slide that says code. So let's dive in. So we're going to start on the TV side. Uh, the TV side, like we said, is going to start advertising. So it's going to call nearby.getConnectionsClient. This nearby class is like a nice singleton helper from the nearby API. And from the client, it's going to call start advertising. Start advertising takes in a bunch of parameters. It takes in a name. This name string is going to be seen on the phone. When it finds all the connections, it can look at the name string. It's going to take in a service ID. This is typically a package ID, a uh, package name. Uh, it's pretty standard practice just to use the package name. It's going to take in a connection lifecycle callback. It's a mouthful. And you need to set a strategy. So if you, if you look at the nearby API, you'll see there's several strategies. One is P2P, point to point. And when I first started, I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Like, I have one TV, I have one phone. This is going to be great. And then I'm like, oh, wait, there's a TV in my bedroom. Hopefully, there one day I'll have a TV in my, my bathroom. Uh, and uh, Cluster is a more robust solution for that. You know, this allows like multi-TV setup. 
or it just builds a more robust solutioning for, for the strategy. There are listeners, success and failure listeners. Uh, don't make the mistake thinking this is like you are advertising and here's a successful person who discovered you. This is just a listener saying we were successful at advertising or we failed at setting up advertising. Uh, it could be something like uh, you're in airplane mode and all of a sudden it can't advertise. So it's going to call the failure listener. Um, these make great debugging points. So when you just try to get started, using the success and failure listener are perfect for debugging. Now, the, the elephant in the room is this connection callback lifecycle. This is kind of where I hit all the magic on that slide. This lifecycle callback, its only purpose is to handle the connection lifecycle. Um, all the phone and TV, how they come together, it's all going to be handled through this. It has three methods, pretty, pretty simple. Connection was initiated, there was a result, or we've disconnected. If we dive in deeper, you know, once a connection is initiated, this is where you should prompt for security. Once the security has been confirmed, the auth token has been confirmed, you know, go ahead and accept the connection. And we'll talk about that later. Next is the result. So depending on what happens from the, the user confirming the code or maybe they left your app or something, you'll get different results codes. You know, is the status okay? The connection has been confirmed. You know, continue, stop advertising. Uh, maybe you're re rejected. You know, ask them to try again. Maybe there's some other error and your app should handle it gracefully. Um, handling that should happen in the connection result. And lastly, disconnected. If you keep track of all the endpoints and you try to manage a map of all the devices you're talking to, on disconnected is a great time to clean up your data from that map. And I talked about accepting the connection. It's a super simple method. Nearby .get connections client .accept connection. This guy takes in an endpoint ID that you're accepting the connection to and a payload callback. Uh, the payload callback is, is where the magic happens between the TV communicating with the phone and the data they want to send to each other. So the connection's lifecycle callback was about how they talk to each other, setting up that connection. This callback is uh, how the, the payloads are going to be transferred between each other. It's two methods, on payload received, on payload transfer update. Uh, on payload received is pretty trivial. You're going to get a payload. And uh, from that payload, you handle it and do whatever you want to do. Once you've finished and you want to send something back to the phone, you can just call send payload and give it a body or a payload that you want to send back to the phone. So this is great. Like you get your payload, you do all this work, you want to send back an acknowledgement, you, know, you just call send a payload. The, the trickier part is uh, the on transfer update. So imagine this is more complex than just sending like a token for login. Maybe you're sending a file, and there's a bunch of bytes being transferred. Um, you want to use on transfer update to figure out the progress of those bytes. Once all of that stuff's done and everything you've sent from your payload is complete, you can disconnect. Uh, this is a great place for the disconnection to happen. So when your status is no longer in progress, you know, go ahead and disconnect. You're done sending all the bytes. For sending messages like acknowledgment or a token, you're going to use like the bytes payload. And that's pretty quick, pretty fast. Uh, for doing bigger things like files, it, you will have, um, you will be in progress a lot longer, and you'll notice something when you're debugging. Um, but this is a, a hidden trick I discovered, and I just want to pass it on. Um, this is all the TV side. That's great, but we talked about multiple services. So what can you do on your phone? How do you make that connection? So step one, you want to discover the TV. Um, this is going to look very familiar. Nearby .get connections client. What do you guys think the method's going to be called? Start discover. Yeah. All right. Someone's awake this morning. So start discover takes in uh, almost the same parameters. It's going to take in a service ID. Um, again, that should be your package name. If your package name for your mobile app and your TV app is the same, that's perfect. If your package name is different, like for your phone, it's going to be com.mycompany.android. And for your TV, it could be com.mycompany.android.tv. Um, it's a little bit different. The, 
the, the two connections won't see each other. Like you're discovering essentially on a different frequency, on a different channel. So you want to make sure that service ID is the same. So if your package name is identical, use that. That's great. If it's different, you might need to set up your own service ID. You're going to give it an endpoint discovery callback, and you're going to set the strategy. You're going to want the strategy to be symmetric to what you sell on the TV. So just go ahead and use cluster again. You also get success listeners and failure listeners. Just like with advertising, these listeners are going to say the setup for discovery was successful or not. Now this mobile endpoint discovery callback is kind of the, the, the big elephant here. Hit a lot of code from you in this one little line. Um, this is where we move on to step two, where we request the connection. This callback is going to have two methods. You either found an endpoint or you lost an endpoint. Um, you can loot, well, I'll get to that in a second. So you find an endpoint. This is where you request a connection. When you request a connection, you, um, you actually, what's going to, OK. When you request a connection, the on connection initiated that we talked about earlier, that's the callback that will be triggered once the connection's been requested. Um, and on endpoint lost, if you're keeping track of anything, maybe the person walked out of the room and they, they lost the connection because they're out of range or whatever, um, this is a great time to clear up or ask the user, hey, you're moving too far away, um, or just gracefully recover when, uh, when you lose an endpoint. And when you request a connection, we pass in this great class, this connection lifecycle callback, which clearly means step three is rinse and repeat. But now, uh, what I love most about the nearby API that I discovered later was it's very symmetric. Uh, from this point on, this connection lifecycle, it's going to be symmetrically inverse to what you did on TV. So this is going to be a fast slide. Looks very familiar. We have the three methods. The first method accepts the security token gives that confirmation to the user. Once it's uh, confirmed, they accept the connection, give it a payload callback. The results, depending on the results of the connection being accepted, you uh, look at OK, you look at rejected, you look at error, whatever the result codes are that you want to handle. And if you disconnect, you clean that up. You know, this looks almost identical. One small difference, see if you can see it, watch closely. You just want to stop discovery, not advertising. Um, trying to do both the phone and TV in like one module. Uh, you have to really focus on like who's the discovery when and who's the, the advertiser when so that you know when to call stop discover versus stop advertiser. Um, but besides that, it's, it's pretty symmetrical and identical. So by the power invested in me in the state of Ohio DevFest, you are all nearby ninjas. Congratulations. So we talked about Log in as a good flow, just setting up the stage. Like using nearby, how can you easily connect two devices, transfer data, make a great experience? But let's talk more about these use cases. So the three pillars, there was uh, media control, content immersion, and frictionless content, or frictionless interaction. So let's move on to that second pillar. Your manager, your product manager is going to come by and say, hey, we need to work on engagement. You know, we're going to send tons of notifications. You being the, the good citizen of a developer that you are, you're going to push back and say, no, that's called annoying the user. We shouldn't do that. And they're going to say, no, it's not annoying the user. This is called re-engagement. So we're going to boost, uh, we're going to boost uh, engagement and, uh, and get better watch time, and everything's going to be great. And you say, fine, whatever, let's do it. I get to work on something cool. So what does this look like? You know, ideally, you get a notification. You know, maybe in this, because I thought I was going to talk to more than three sports fans, but in this case, you get uh, a notification, the, the game's starting. Um, this could be, you know, someone sets up to watch their favorite shows in your app, and every time a new show is released, they can get a notification. And using nearby to, like, proximity detect and stuff, you can add in a second button, watch on TV. Um, or you always leave that button there, and they could be at work, accidentally hit that button, their TV turns on at home. Uh, so you can make the experience as great as you want, or as, as uh, well, just make the experience as great as you want. Um, but they hit watch on TV. And as soon as they hit that, you'll notice the TV turns on. And all of a sudden, they have this content immersion. You know, They're getting the scores. They're seeing highlights. They're able to look at the schedule for the games. They're able to see how their players are doing. 
maybe if you're in the business, you start doing advertising. Be like, hey, we know you like this player, here's their jersey. Um, maybe it's a grocery app and you want to be like, here's recipes to the shows you're watching. Um, but once the user, you know, the user has a choice, it's on their phone, they could do or not. And maybe they want to just focus on the game. You know, supplying that to, for that lean in user is great, but don't like actively push on it. Let it still be more of a passive, let them engage in it and just apply the experience. So how do you go about doing this? Well, this is simply just launching an activity from a push notification, which sounds really simple. Um, how many of you have done push notifications before? All right, like half. Um, using FCM or, or some other thing? FCM, all right. Uh, so you just sleep for like the next five minutes. Um, but I'm gonna like briefly touch on FCM. You're gonna have a Firebase messaging service that you register in your, in your app. You know, you're gonna receive a message. If you've done push notifications, you're very familiar with like, you're going, you always add some type of action and depending on what the action is, the client's able to handle a certain way. So you're gonna get some action, depending on that action, you know, you just say start watching. This is all pretty basic stuff if you've done push notifications. Um, if not, the documentation and the tutorials and code labs will get you there in like 10 minutes. Um, but start watching, start watching. This is gonna look even more boring. How many of you have been Android developers for like more than a day? Yeah, so pretty much everyone knows how to make an intent, add an extra to the intent, like here's the video that you're gonna watch, and then call and start activity. You know, nothing groundbreaking here. But what do you do when the screen's off? You know, you're at home, maybe you're cooking dinner, and you get that notification, oh, the game's about to start. You know, I could ask my assistant to turn it on, or I could just, you know, hit a button on my phone. Um, but it, hitting the button on the phone can turn on the TV and turn it to the game. That's a magical moment. So with TVs, we have an advantage over phones. Yeah, this is why I love the TV space. No phone problems, we have our own problems. Um, but there's no lock screen typically, right? It's a shared environment, unless you're doing like parental controls um, and you're going down that customized path. But for the most part, it's pretty open. Anyone can hit the power button on the remote. There's no, there's no keypad or anything to, to unlock it. So most of these issues, um, all we have to focus on is just turn on the TV. We have just your standard boring fragment activity, sets up a view. The only things you need to add to this activity is set shown when lock, and in tandem, set turn screen on to true. Um, these are two methods that are in activity, and between these two, this double combo, it will turn on your TV from a push notification. Well, well it'll turn on your TV for this activity. Um, the tricky part is these were added in API 27. So you just need to check, hey, in my past API 27, do this. Uh, if you've been an Android developer for longer than one release, this code probably does not look that foreign to you. Um, the fallback is just to set the flags. So there, there's two flags, flag turn screen on, flag show when locked. Those are pretty much what's happening under the covers when you call those methods anyway. All right, so just to recap, you have a phone, it gets notification. You have a button, watch on TV. You trigger that push notification. You launch an activity. Boom, magical moment. Drop the remote. I mean, Mike. I mean, what is this, a TV? All right, so the third pillar, frictionless interactions. So let's look at the use case of payments. Um, we, we talked about the UFC fight. So maybe you're watching something and triggers you, oh, you wanna buy the UFC fight for this weekend. Um, you get a nice little prompt on the TV. You wanna pay for it, send you to the app. It doesn't have to be text messaging. Um, if you have a mobile app, you should definitely use your mobile app. Uh, this is just brainstorming idea here. Um, you say, hey, do you wanna purchase the UFC fight? You know, authenticate yourself. You're looking good, it's purchased. And then once it's been purchased, update the state of your app on the TV to say, hey, this is now went from purchased to start watching. Maybe even in that interim when you're communicating on the phone, update the TV to say, hey, complete purchase on the phone um, so that the user always, no matter what screen they're looking at, knows what to do. Uh, this is great. You get two-factor authentication. 
You can use fingerprint scanners. I was talking to a couple of you and you say you love the fingerprint scanner on the Pixel. You know, here's another great time to use it. Um, and and the, the recommendation is you should support the platform default and fall to a secondary method. You know, if you're, if you're Apple and you have the face ID, um, you know, use that. If you're uh, on a Pixel or Samsung and you want to use fingerprint, use that. If a phone doesn't have that, you know, make sure to support PIN or password as a way to, to accept authentication. And the last thing about payments is I kind of find this to be like a really cool family-friendly feature. You know, you're at work and your son or daughter is at home trying to buy the next season of Dora the Explorer and you get a notification, hey, you want to pay for Dora the Explorer? Well, you know like what your kid's doing at home now, they're trying to buy more content and you're able to control this remotely. So even though this isn't necessarily you in the living room, but it gives you more access and control over the content your family's trying to purchase from, from, from home. So how does this look from an architecture perspective? You're going to have an Android app and a mobile app, and you're going to have your back end with FCM. The TV is going to say, hey, I want to make a payment. Your back end is probably going to say, you're entitled to this content or not. Um, all right, let's finish the payment on the phone. You open up your phone, the phone's going to say, okay, they're authorized. They've made this payment. This is great. Let's, uh, let's get them watching content. And your back end can send that FCM notification again, just like we did before. Update the TV app, and the user can start watching right away. But think more than just payments. You know, this is just one example. There's many other examples where um, you, can, you can start going to like the social, social space. So imagine we're watching Jimmy Fallon, and I'm like, oh man, this is a hilarious clip. Hey, I'm going to ask my app, the assistant, whatever, but I just want to share. And yeah, I want to tell her that this is hilarious and she should watch this clip. I thought it was funny. I want to share it. And then all of a sudden on her phone, she gets a notification saying, hey, you, know, you should watch this clip. Your friend Ben over here thinks it's hilarious and thinks you'd like it. So it's more than just payments. You know, we can do login, we can do re-engagement, you know, you can do recipes for a, for a TV show, you can show cast of characters for movies. Um, it's a wider gamut of things that you can accomplish. Just think about what your app is trying to solve, what content they give their users, how can you take it further? So to recap, to put these three pillars in one-liners, you know, you want to raise re-engagement. You know, your imagination is your limit when it comes to content immersion, the fantasy football is a great way to think about, oh, here's a football game going on. How can we immerse them in more content that they want to see? Um, and then frictionless interactions. How can you remove, remove those barriers of entry into your content? The whole purpose is to just achieve more, having the user do less. So with that, thank you very much for having me.